everybody. Hi, Megan. Hello. I am absolutely thrilled to be talking to you today and uh, talking to everybody who's um, here through Facebook to discuss your new book, One Life, yeah. which was out this week. Um, it's real. <laughs> Our new book. Our new book. Well, I was going to I was going to start by saying that it's a big theme of the book, the perennial inability of women to claim credit for their own achievements. So the way I wanted to start is by saying this will, without doubt, be the best book that people read this year. <laughs> and that's 90% due to Megan being an icon and 10% down to my own amazing qualities. <laughs> as a co-writer. I don't know if your percentages are, are right there, but um, you are certainly incredible. I actually can't believe how much it's just like bouncing back at me, my own self when I read the book. I mean, I, I, I mentioned that in the beginning, like the first like time I ever like actually like read pages or whatever, I was like, this is so incredible and such a weird feeling of being captured so perfectly that you're actually just like, it's like hearing feedback, like when you hear feedback loop. It was crazy. So it was amazing. Well, you have a very, very coherent personality, which is an odd, it's quite an odd quality, but it's very <laughs> useful um, uh, for the purposes of uh, helping you to birth. What we talk a little bit about how you came to want it and um, then I'm going to uh, read out some questions. We've had a lot of excellent questions come in. Um, and um, I, summer, when you came back from the World Cup and you first started thinking that this was the moment that you wanted to cohere all of your ideas and all of your experiences in a book and a book which you expressly didn't want to be a conventional sports memoir. So it's a great advantage of this narrative that it's not just about a soccer although there is a lot of soccer in it you broke up a little bit and oh. asked your question or are you just, think, just wondering my my thought process and even wanting yeah. to write a book yeah what was it about that moment when you came back to the u.s after winning the world cup that made you think now was the moment that you had to seize mm -hmm. i think it was twofold i think there was a just to be really frank and honest a big part that was like of course i'm going to write a book like i just like blew up the world and was like this you know the president tweeted at me and we won the world cup and like i have pink hair and i'm this like famous person now so it was like yeah of course you're gonna write a book like you're gonna go on this show you're gonna write this book you're gonna do this magazine you're gonna do all these things so part of it was just like you know this is what's gonna happen um i have thought i mean obviously other teammates of mine have written books other athletes have written you know, books and memoirs. So I have thought like, oh, maybe I should write a book or people have told me like, you should write a book. And I'm always, I was always like, I mean, what am I going to write about? You know, like I, I sure I could, anyone could write a memoir. doesn't mean it's going to be good or uh, a reason that people should read it. But I, I did feel after this, I, after last summer, I was like, okay, there's, there's something so much more here. I think I, I think I really realized that in in Lyon in the final, when we're hearing the equal pay chance and the experience of the World Cup feeling as though, yes, people came to watch soccer. Yes, they came to watch us. Yes, they came to watch the World Cup, but they came for so many other reasons. I feel like they came and like, you know, fought for equality at the games. They came and lived their full selves at the games and coming back to New York, um, going through the parade, it, it just was so clear to me that like the team didn't win the world cup, like everybody won. I feel like equality won. It was something special. It was something, you know, a, a good news for once in uh, a country that had, you know, been through a little bit of bad news and hard times. And it was just one of those things where I was like, Oh, everyone's participating in this. They're not just fans. They're not just looking on people. Aren't just, casually watching the games they're like the game they're invested in it and in a way it, it sort of gave them a win in their life or changed their life in ways or gave them a motivation and so I think I was kind of like okay let's try to at least capture this in in words or tell my story or at least just give a an insight into how I go about living my life and maybe that's inspiring to other people do you do you have a sense of who you're talking to do you have a, like an ideal reader and and do you also have an idea of the reader who is not 
necessarily the natural audience for this kind of story, but who might be persuaded? Because you talk, you talk in the book very um, affectingly about how you wanted to broaden the conversation, and that there's there's you know there's something about the traditional soccer fan demographic which is very appealing to you because it's a uh, it's you're you're bringing to that crowd a conversation that they might not otherwise be getting on tra on their traditional facebook feeds or whatever so who who are you talking to i mean i think there's a a portion of people that just are like hardcore fans it's going to be a lot of gays it's going to be a lot of progressives um it's you know going to be a lot of people fighting for equality of all sorts so it's like you know that's sort of the base of it but then there's a lot of people, and I've had this feeling for a long time, that the more outspoken I've gotten and the more sort of, you know, out there, like, even when people say they hate me, they kind of can't look away. Like the they're French, like, right? Like the French. The <laughs> French are the perfect example. Uh, they're like, oh, this is crazy, but, like, we literally can't take our eyes off it. And I think there's something in me that is very prevalent in – American society and American culture. I'm just doing it for the opposite reason than we normally do it, which is a brashness and, you know, at times an arrogance and like kind of a wildness and just like a, an, an undeniable confidence in oneself, you know, for no other reason just than because I have it, I guess, in some ways. And so I think I'm sort of like familiar to people, but I'm like on the opposite side of things because I'm a woman and I'm gay and you know, I have pink hair and I'm like, you know, saying all these things or whatever it is. So I think there's that portion of people that like want to be haters, but they're like, want to also read every single thing about it and know every single thing that, that I'm doing. Um, and then I think too, there's, you know, certain people maybe who are just in the middle. Um, yeah, maybe there's a lot of soccer fans or, you know, soccer parents or moms or dads or just casual kind of fans who are like what is going on here like my kid watches this team or I've watched this team um let me just see a little bit more of of what she's talking about um I don't know about like the other spectrum um but I guess it's like if people want to just take a deeper look into something that they love or they hate this is the the book for it I, I I'm not trying to you know, say a specific thing or pull the wool or try to make myself look a certain way. I feel like it's just kind of like, well, here it is. Yeah. Either like it, like it or you don't. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. I mean, it's what what's interesting to me about that is how, and this relates to your own family. And again, you talk about this a lot in the book. Um, you know, at this moment in time, I think a lot of people are struggling with the idea of even being in a room with people who disagree with them <laughs> politically. And it's, uh, become almost like a gag reflex. I mean, it's really hard to imagine having a conversation with someone who voted the other way right now. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, as you know better than anyone, you don't you don't persuade people by failing to engage with them or calling them stupid. And we have these dynamics with it, within our wider families, you know, with people we love that have to be confronted. So what, like, you've been through all of this with family members who voted for Trump. I don't know whether they voted for Trump this time around. <laughs> or whether you managed to talk them around. <laughs> uh, I think there's a little bit of both. <laughs> um, but you, ha you have to engage, right? I mean, it, you have to get over that sanctimony and talk to the other side. Mm -hmm. I think there's a part of it to me that I try to be realistic and like, clearly all of these things have been around and people have been feeling them and thinking them for a while. So this isn't the first time I've been in a room with someone that's racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever it may be, even if they didn't say it before, even if they don't say it now and just by their vote, they're at least condoning it. So it's it's like all things are true at, at one time. Of course, I, I never want to condone any of that, but like it's already happening. So within our families and everything, it's just all really brought out to to the forefront now and like brought into the light, which does make it more difficult because it's things that you can't really just pull the rug over anymore. Um, but with my family, I feel like things are, you know, things are complicated with people. There's, you know, multiple things can be true at one time. Um, and not everybody understands the lived experience or perspective of other people. I get that. I don't, I don't think naturally we can, we can know certain things. Now, I would say to people, I wish that you would make any effort 
to learn and to understand what other people are going through and maybe understand a deeper historical context for a lot of different reasons, things that are happening in our country. But we're not really going to get anywhere as frustrating as it is. And as much as I, you know, have a bajillion tweet drafts that I just want to rip off, but like, what's it going to do? You know, really like Mm -hmm. we're, we're getting to this place now we're so polarized. We can't even have a conversation about anything. And with that, that's difficult because I think, you know, just progressives and Democrat or uh, Democrats or Republicans, it's like, oh, why can't we just meet in the middle? And it's like, well, because we're not on, we're not like equidistant from the middle right, right. now. And so there are certain things that are just cannot be compromised. I mean, if, you know, the humanity and dignity of people, um, you know, and the full citizenship of people and rights and, you know, being able to just like live your damn life in this country for some people is really difficult. Mm. And so equating like your, you know, desire to vote for the economy or a foreign policy or whatever is not the same as me feeling like I literally have to vote for my life or the life of people like me. And so that's really where the conversation is difficult. So how do you, how do you then tell people that? I think there's a lot of question asking Um, there's a lot of like compromise in terms of like, let me see your side so you can see my side and let's have that conversation. Um, but it's hard. It it is really hard when, when people are equating things that aren't the same. Right. The stakes are different. It's, it's, stakes are different. Yeah. Fascinating. That's a really, that's a, that's very true. Um, okay. Let's, let me, let's look at some questions that have come in. They're all great and they make me feel that I should have asked some of them <laughs> to you before <laughs> you wrote the book together, especially the ones about soccer. <laughs> anyway. No, I told you, I, I, I made it very clear. I don't want this to be about soccer, so I probably scared you into not asking too many soccer questions. You certainly found someone who isn't a soccer journalist. <laughs> um, that is um, good. Uh, okay, so, and by the way, we were glitching earlier because I was logged on to my neighbor's Wi-Fi. I just noticed. Uh, I fixed that. Classic. Okay classic um okay so this is a question from jane who's in new york and she says what are the benefits and more interestingly perhaps disadvantages of being a queer icon oh um it's hard to explain the benefits of being gay because i think the common i mean you know this in in writing this book with me you, you know when i was sort of explaining my coming out process and just the fact that when I did figure out that I was gay, I was like, this is awesome. That is very much, I would say not the norm, but also certainly not the stereotype. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we don't really think about gay as being something that's positive. It's always like, you know, the, the classic line is that, oh, you, I mean, you would never like choose to be gay. And I was like, uh, I don't really agree with that. I, I think I, I disagree with that. Obviously having the experience of, of being gay and living as a gay woman, I, I feel like it's given me just an incredible perspective that I never would have had. Like I'm a white woman in this country that comes from the middle class. That that would be who I am. I, I don't really have any sort of minority status or like discriminatory status other than being a woman which I guess is a big one but I'm also a white woman so I'm like pretty high up there you know and so I feel like it's given me not only a different perspective not to say that my minority status is anywhere near other minorities minority statuses in our country but it's given me like an idea of what that could possibly be like Mm -hmm. that someone could just see me on the street and like throw a slur at me like Mm -hmm. you don't even know me you just like know I have short hair so the empathy I think that I've gained and just the perspective that's been able to bleed out into the rest of the world and help shape my understanding of how the rest of the world works, like is just something that I'm forever grateful for. The disadvantages, I don't know. I don't really see any disadvantages. I mean, I, I guess I, I'm certain there are some, maybe there's like certain deals that I didn't get cause like I wasn't girly enough or I don't know, but I, I don't really see it that way. And I don't know if I could ever understand it because that's just not my life experience. I feel like my experience as a gay person has been really positive, but I think that is you know, my personal experience while the general experience, like people do really struggle and their families kick them out and you know, kids are dealing with homelessness and 
mm-hmm. all you know genders or d- discrimination in the workplace all of these things so i guess that is a disadvantage but i see it as giving me giving it giving me this like platform to fight from mm. and i don't know if i would have had that if i wasn't gay and i think anyone who is gay and like is comfortable and gotten to a place where they feel good about it is like oh god i couldn't imagine being straight it's what well, right <laughs> right you <ew. laughs> uh, i know oh my god <laughs> um, um um uh all the like bad furniture that comes in with <laughs> But I am um, the, the funny thing is I keep saying this again and again. To me, one of the most extraordinary aspects of your story and and the book is the is exactly what you're what you're saying, which is this idea of it as an expansion, not a diminishment. Which I just have not seen anywhere. That this is like this makes you more, not less. And it's also very true what you say about. Um, you know, people never saying that you would choose that. It was, I, I had a friend of mine uh, used to play this trick on progressive friends of his when he had a baby, he would flush out latent conservatism in them by saying, we're raising him gay. And before they could arrange their features, the look of just amazing horror <laughs> on their faces. Yeah. So, um, so this really feels like a first in this book to have someone stand up and be like, I realized I was gay at college. It was awesome. My life began, end of. I think that, I think I'm just thinking of it now and I've been um, talking about it a bit recently, but I think that being gay out of necessity requires you to think about what it is that you want and how you want your life to be, because like, you're not going to like, you know, marry a guy and you're not going to have this sort of traditional life per se. You can choose to have a very traditional life. You can choose to, you know, be gay and like, you know, marry whatever. I could marry anybody and we could like have 2.5 kids and have a white pig. But like we could do that, but it it does require a conscious decision to do that. Whereas I think a lot of straight people just by sheer amount of like norms thrown at them all the time, I don't think they quite get the freedom or or it's not a necessity to them to have to make those choices. Yeah. And I believe that it's interesting. It's like we live in this society where we all try to shove ourselves into boxes that are, you know, this big. And everybody knows that like nobody fits into the box. And everybody knows individually that no one is like them in the entire world. And yet we still kind of try to shove ourselves in these tiny little boxes. And I believe we all need to like fiercely explore our individuality as a as a like a form of survival. And so if we're all our full selves and just allow each other to be like gay, straight, whatever you may be, I think we'd be a lot better off. And I feel like gay sort of gives you and has given me the opportunity to do that in this, even just in a small way of sexuality that I've just like ran with in terms of my whole life and and my whole world and my thought processes and everything. So I feel just like free, like I can do whatever I want because I'm the only one making the decisions on what I want to do and what I want to say and who I want to be. Yeah, so that's an extraordinary reframing, and it's and it's not the prevalent conversation still, in spite of how much things have advanced. So I find it, frankly, mind blowing. And by the way, in the way that all gays like to identify undiagnosed damage in other gays, <laughs> um, uh, the sporty lesbians in my social group who are already, of course, devouring this book have been in touch to tell me that there's no way you can be this at peace with yourself and that there must be like a U-Haul truck full of repressed repressed shame and denial that one day is gonna pull up outside your house. (laughs) And I I, I didn't didn't see it, I didn't see it. (laughs) Thank you, I'm like, if it it is gonna sneak up, it's gonna fucking blind, oh, am I allowed to come? It's gonna blindside me because I I don't really think that it's coming. It, It is really kind of amazing though like I think that for myself too. I'm like, are you sure there was like, there's not some like hidden storage locker in your brain that you're just hiding things in? But I don't know. Being gay is awesome, and I I feel like I feel like I was always kind of waiting, like in high school, like you know, I, I, being attracted to guys or not. I had a couple boyfriends, and I'm just kind of like, it, I think especially sexually, I was like, this is not really how I'm even supposed to like feel for myself like inside like I'm supposed to be like excited to see this person and then like the minute I had like my first experience with a girl I was like 
Thank God. Well, obviously. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, oh, this is so there. much better. This is like literally everything just like makes sense. So yeah. amazing. Awesome. Okay. Um, comprehensively dealt with. Oh, all right. So let's see. Uh, Tracy, who is in Brandon in Mississippi. What is the one thing that we as women should be working towards at the moment? I think first and foremost, kind of what I was touching on for yourself. I think you need to start asking. We need to all start asking ourselves, like, what do we want? What kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of life do we want to have? What kind of relationships, what kind of dynamics within those relationships do we want to have? Um, interestingly, I think in the pandemic, even the most progressive of women found themselves being like, wow, our gender roles are really solid here. And like, I'm taking care of the kids. I'm doing the bulk of the housework. And like, even both parents that are working, you know, the men thought that like the the splitting up of duties was 50 50 and it was like, you know, 99 one. Mm -hmm. So I think like thinking that for ourselves to figure out what we want and then demanding that in, in the sort of greater society, I would also say like find other women who are having this sort of like internal revolution with themselves, like find that community because I think you can feel crazy. Like you can feel like you're just being gaslit all over the place because you are. And like finding other people that are like, no, this is, this is right. This is real. This is what I'm feeling too. This is what other women are feeling. Um, I feel like I have that experience growing up on the national team. I say it's a lot. Normally if you're elite in your field as a woman, you're like one of one or one of very few. And we all grew up around, you know, 20 plus women with alumni and players that come and go But that was our like societal bounce board like mm -hmm. is this okay yes are you feeling this yes is this is how we should act yes so finding that community i think is really important and yet what the, the extraordinary thing about that is as you say you were you were the elite of the elite you weren't exactly um without resources confidence wise and yet nonetheless you've had to go to extraordinary lengths <laughs> to mm -hmm. not even be at the same starting point as your male equivalents in, in the sport. And you're still having to deal with just unbelievable rubbish every day. Um, we, I mean, we were talking yesterday about the, the head of the FA in England having to resign after he said unbelievable things about black players, but also about women. Did you see his comments about women players that he, yes. he said he'd heard not this wasn't his own thought he'd heard it on the wind that there were that there weren't enough female goalkeepers because girls don't like to have the ball hit at them too hard <laughs> I mean, i'm just like you actually let that come out of your mouth like in a parliamentary hearing like that came out of your actual mouth you thought it and then you were like yeah i'm gonna spit this out this is crazy town <laughs> um so i mean yeah if you if you guys are still having to fight the fight it's it's a long way from from over it really is i mean it, that's a it's just constant like you, you have to con our whole society really is set up with certain norms and things that we consider normal and things that are okay and you know it, it is frustrating like at every instance to just constantly be having to be like that's not right that's not right that's not mm -hmm. right that's not and it's just like yeah, you do, like, you are even nagging to yourself. Like, it's just like, do I, uh, do I want to be the one to, like, say this again? Do I have to be the one? Why can't, like, other, you know, why can't men hold themselves accountable when it comes to this stuff? But it's just, like, unfortunately, that's just reality right now. And I just always kind of stick to the, like, I know that I'm right. I feel it. I've lived it. Like, all my teammates have lived it. We understand it. And it's just, you know, constantly fighting through the gaslighting and the manipulation. Well, there's a line in the book, which I love, which you said to me, which, again, it totally re reassembled my thinking about this, which is that I think for a lot of us, um, there's a kind of social embarrassment about speaking up on our own behalves because we are told constantly not to make a fuss. And repeatedly... <laughs> Um, blown through that prohibition and I always found it very hard to just understand how you could bear that moment of awkwardness when you know people looked at, looked at you as if you were being monstrously rude and the thing that you said which is so true was that you always thought about the people you were speaking for not the people you were speaking to 
And the minute you said that, it just changed my thinking about the whole thing, which is that you are not representing yourself as an individual, but you are, you know, this, you're doing something bigger than that. And a, a moment of social embarrassment is, you know, is nothing compared to the impact that you might have by speaking up. Yeah. And I, th I think I know a little bit too, like, I'm not just saying anything. I'm not just like saying wild stuff. Like I'm saying what everyone knows is true and yes. people either want to like admit it or not or get on board or not, but like people know that it's true. So even, I don't know, like at the uh, Sports Illustrated Awards dinner, like, yeah, it's going to be kind of awkward to say it. First of all, like who's going to say anything to me? I'm like, I won the award. I didn't pick myself. Y'all pick me. So I know you ain't going to say anything to me. So then it's like, I do have some confidence from that. That's why I think my arrogance and my, you know, uh, yeah, just uh, confidence in myself comes from, because I'm like, I know you ain't saying shit to me. But I think there is a part that's like, I'm going to say this and it's going to be awkward, but like, it's not like someone's going to pull me aside and be like, hey, I think you were like off base, you know, like my, you know, my agent who I really trust or Jess who I really trust or my family or something. It's not like anybody is going to like really pull me aside and be like, I think you were really off base. Like, because right. I'm not off base. So it's like the awkwardness is that everyone kind of like knows it. And a lot of people are probably thinking in it, but the power in it is that the people or person who I'm saying it to, they know it too. And they, it, they either are wildly manipulative and narcissistic, narcissistic and they just come back and say, no, you're wrong, which normally doesn't happen. And it wouldn't happen in that setting. Or they're just kind of like, yeah, that's right. not well, to, great. <laughs> to fill in the gaps for everyone, th this was when uh, Megan last year was given the Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year Award, which has been awarded to very few women in its long history. And when she was making a speech, 20 feet from the table where the editor and publisher sat, she called out the magazine for not hiring enough people of color, writers of color, right, uh, female bylines are, you know, in uh, notably absent from that magazine, and it was um, it was bold, <laughs> um, but it, but they were as you see they were, they were rewarding you not just as a sports person but for doing precisely what you turned around and then did in that speech. Mm -hmm. so it, it and a little a little bit of it was like, oh okay, like obviously you know I'm I'm going to be up for the award. It's you know a pretty you know frankly I think easy choice considering what happened and it's going to make you as a magazine look really good because mm -hmm. I will represent you on your cover and mm -hmm. so you don't get to now like just like coattail on me and the things that I'm doing when you're not doing them right. and so like I'm fine with like some co-leveraging and some mutually beneficial mm -hmm. but like not in the sense that like you're just going to try to glaze over with this really popular figure right now to yeah sort of co-endorsed racism and all these kinds of things or, or anti-racism, whatever. So it's kind of like, I sort of, you know, it, like I said, I'm like, you picked me. So you should have known that I was going to, <laughs> I was going to do something <laughs> like this, but you don't get to like coattail on, like you need to do the work too. And I, I think that, you know, me being willing to say that just, you know, proves that they were right, that they should have put me on so we can like move forward. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very shrewd assessment and, and, and absolutely brilliantly done. Um, oh, you see, this is the thing that I didn't know to ask. Kate from San Antonio in Texas, what is your favorite practice drill? Oof, um, anything that involves shooting, really. Okay. Any kind of, yeah, any shooting on goal. Yeah, just like kind of, you know, a pass and a pass back and where you just get to shoot a bunch of times. That's great. I don't want to do any like defense or other kinds of drills. Okay. Or 5v5 is really fun. It's like small sided. It's like just a little like fun 5v5 yeah. uh, game. Okay. Um, this is Melinda from Irvington in Alabama. Megan, as a mom of two girls that play soccer, 16 and 12, what advice could you give them in terms of facing obstacles in the future? And just before you answer, I would say that it's weird, but I felt that there is something about this book that oddly is like a parenting manual because your mom is like <laughs> such a breakout star of the narrative. She is. Uh, it's worth buying for Denise, I have to say. It's um, true. And she's just like a fount of wisdom and uh, everything that you are is basically because of her, right? Yeah, 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 pretty much. Um, I mean, she's just an incredible woman and like so humble and so wild and so just 
herself and has such an, an incredible life and incre- incredible experiences. I know. I mean, we've been saying she needs a show forever, a show or a book or a series or multi series. I don't know what she needs, um, but she needs it all. She needs to be in the public eye. Um, in terms of the obstacles, I always look at like, of course, it's like you're just going to fail over and over and over in life. Like you're going to have actually probably, you know, fewer moments where you really truly succeed than you are failing. It's mm-hmm. just a fact of life. You get better. So I don't see it really as failure or succeeding, um, failure or success, more just like this is life. Like this is what it is. There's no magic pill. There's no magic bullet. There's no like special sauce. It's just like you work hard. You learn from your mistakes. Like you treat other people well. You treat yourself well. I think also that's like something that we need to do a lot better. I think we have just like a a culture of sort of like negative self-talk, like just motivate yourself. It's like sometimes we just need to like give ourselves a hug and, and be nice. But it's like the the journey of it like is the point and you know sometimes you get to the end of a certain goal and you've done it or not and it 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 kind of at the end I feel like I've been in these situations where we've either won or not won heartbreaking losses or not and it's like if you did everything the right way then it sucks to lose it sucks to like lose we literally lost in the world cup final like we gave a goal up in the last like minute and then we're terrible in penalty kicks and we lost the world cup final in 2011 and it was kind of like, but the whole journey was like, we, we did what we wanted to do. We did it how we wanted to do it. And we left everything out there. And like at the, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, then I don't think that's like the end all be all. And I think oftentimes we're so, you know, end point focused that you lose all of the goodness that comes with the journey. So it, it's like, it's going to be hard, but that's also fun and good. And you, you learn a lot about yourself in there. I'm sure that's right. And it relates to something that is fascinating in the book about the way the junior soccer world is now compared to how it was back in the day, certainly where you were, which is, you know, in some ways, of course, it's better now because there are more opportunities and there's more money flowing into the girls game. But what I found so interesting about your background in soccer is that you benefited from being off the grid until really the last minute. Um, So it, it, in some ways, it's become, you say, it's become over pressurized, over goal oriented, over, you know, kids, kids, are, kids are being told they're failures at 11 if they haven't been put on the national youth squad or whatever. So it's it was better in your day in, to some degree. I think so. I, I think it's just unrealistic at this point. I mean, you said yeah. I, I think the the opposite of what you just said of people being told that they're failures at 11 is that people are being told that they can be a superstar at 11 and that if you just do all these things then you'll like get to this point as if it's just this roadmap when in reality and I say I speak this for myself and I, I think I did have an unusual road and I was kind of off the grid and like didn't practice all that much and most of the time just played games on the weekends and wasn't in this really strict thing like I was born with like 99 percent of what I needed to become a professional athlete like that's just uh, you just I mean you cannot work into God-given talent like you just can't so like LeBron James he's supposed to be where he's at he's six eight he weighs 240 he can jump out of the gym he's clearly crazy athletic like some of it is that like you just got what you got in a way mm-hmm. which to me then like ruins sports because if you know I got 99 percent of of what I needed and I'm in that one percent well, then the rest of the kids who really, truly, frankly, have like no shot of playing, you know, in a World Cup, that doesn't mean that sports can't be incredible for them. And like, the whole process of playing sports, just from a physical standpoint, from socialization, from confidence building, conflict management, um, you know, being around kids from different areas and different parts of the state and different demographics and socioeconomic statuses and whatever, it just takes the whole most of the goodness out of sport and just says the only thing that's important is if you win and you're going to be a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, everyone knows that everyone knows the statistics. It's, you know, one in a million, one in, you know, even more than that. And it's frustrating that 
we just put so much emphasis into that because it really does like mess up the kids and like it's not fun for them if at 11 12 13 years old when clearly they're not you know clearly they're not athletic they're like you know got two left feet and we're still like oh you need to play on this you know competitive club team and then you play on the team and then you don't even play it's like this is this is dumb so i just feel like the unrealistic part of it is frustrating to me because i just think it's harming so many kids and really taking all of the amazing things that you can get out of sport just because you're not gonna play at the highest level yeah that makes total sense and you to that point your parents never had to motivate you you and your sister right it was you were standing by the door ready to go that was all self-generated i mean once they enabled you once once that desire had been expressed but it was all coming from some internal source that you yeah i think it was i mean i i think you know they were super supportive but no i don't think you know in their heart of hearts they were like yeah i can't wait to get in the car for a thousand hours again this weekend (laughs) i think they were like if you love this and if you want this like you tell us you know we we want you to drive and of course there's certain times where they've motivated us and that but they really did want us to have to make that decision as well they wanted us to think about that it wasn't just like this is what I'm doing. I'm going to soccer practice. I'm going to basketball. I'm going to school. You know, they were like, no, you decide, you know, even the, the choice of playing high school basketball or high school soccer, they're like, you guys do whatever you want. Of course, everybody wanted us to play high school soccer that was involved with the soccer team, but like, we didn't want to, we wanted to play basketball. And then in our junior year, we didn't want to play basketball that year because we were traveling so much and it was going to be too much. And then our senior year, we decided to play basketball again. So I, I I like that part, not just from the standpoint of like, you know, you, you should let your kids do whatever, but you should actually force them to make the choice and to really think about for themselves, like, what do I want? What mm. is this? This is just like, you can't just put them on a path and like, you know, be like, this is your whole life. I, th- I think they sort of forced us to like critically think about things at a young age. Yeah. What, um, so uh, connected to this, uh, Jessica in Tacoma, Washington says, if you could say one thing to coaches of young players, then what would it be? I mean, I think just to, first and foremost, like there's, like I said before, the, you know, probably all of your kids bar a couple in your whole career as a coach, like all of them are not going to be professional athletes. So what are the other things that we can learn through sport? Obviously it's physically really good for you just to move your body the conflict management, the teamwork, all of that kind of stuff, really like get into that. I think dive into those sort of team bonding, teamworks kinds of things. Um, And I think to just be honest with people as well. I think sometimes clubs, because they're a for-profit club, like if you're for-profit anything, like your, your job is to make money, right? And so what are you doing to make money? Oh, if you play in this club team, this will give you a better shot to like be seen at this tournament. And it's like, you're getting a lot of kids who are spending a lot of money on these teams that really should be probably playing at a lower level so they can actually play. Mm. Um, and then also just, you know, always reiterating that like it's a sport, it's for fun, it's a game. And it should, it should be that, um, you know, you got parents wiling out on the sidelines, coaches are getting all crazy, like tacking refs and doing all these things. And that like really doesn't set a good example for the kids. So I think just to be like really realistic and honest with the kids while at the same time, really leaning into all the things that everybody can benefit from, not just, you know, the kids that aren't going to be professional athletes, but you know, maybe even the best kids is probably the, the best uh, the ones that should be getting all that information as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so here is a good question from someone called Taylor in Charlottesville in Virginia. Um, there's a, a, a critical um, period of your life when you were at college, when you got injured twice in short succession, and it seemed for a minute as if your future playing career would be in jeopardy, and it was a, you know, it was a terrible psychological, you know, long haul to to dig yourself back out of it. And your sister said to me that this was the most miserable she'd ever seen you. (laughs) This question is, how do you stay motivated during injury? I have had too many concussions and can't play soccer anymore, probably ever competitively. And I'm finding it difficult to motivate myself, be active and work out after two years of post concussion limitations. Hmm. That's difficult. Um, I, I've fortunately never had a sort, you know, I've never even had a concussion, lock on wood. Um, 
I try to stay as far away from danger as I possibly can. Um, but to have a sort of, you know, career ending type injury, uh, I think is, is really difficult. I've dealt more with just like long term, but I think there is some sort of, you know, when something is taken away from you pre- prematurely and unfairly and without reason, I think that that can be really difficult. I try with my injuries first and foremost like let myself feel it like you know I think in the beginning my very first injury I didn't really let myself feel anything I was like this is what I'm gonna do like I'm gonna beat it I'm gonna do this I'm I I I I I I I and it was like not until the second one I realized like okay let me just like step back here um I am sad like I do feel a loss in some way um and and I think once you allow yourself to feel that you can start to maybe it's a grieving process of losing something that you love. Maybe it's just you're scared, um, whatever emotion that it is. I think if, when you really let yourself feel it, you can like start to understand it and, you know, move past it. And I think when we don't understand it, that's when it has so much power over us. Um, and I think I always looked at my injuries as an opportunity to either do other things with the time that I'll now have or to work on things that I just didn't really have time to work on, whether that be strength stuff or, um, you know, parts of my game that I just, you know, while you're playing, you're kind of in it and, and you can't really work on the other things. So I think those are, are probably the, the two biggest ones. And I mean, it's not really that comforting, but like sometimes, you know, life just happens and it just happens because it happens. Um, I'm not an overly religious or at all a religious person. So I don't believe in that, but I, I do think that, um, you know, life happens. And I think when we appropriately like assess that situation, like another, you know, door opens or however you want to look at it. Sure. I mean, it's, it's because, you, you know, you say in the book that when, after that first injury, when you actively repressed the possibility that it was more serious than it might've been and did the whole, you know, bravado, I'm going to get back out there, motivation mm-hmm. speaking for yourself. It was so counterproductive. You ended up damaging yourself even further because like you have to mess. step up to the tide, right? I mean, it's like you can't, you have to let it bring you to shore in its own time. Yeah, exactly. And it's like things, you know, things are going to manifest themselves the way they are. Stress manifests itself physically in some way, fear, all of that. And like, you're not just going to like will your body into doing exactly what it wants if it's not able. So in, in a lot of ways, like, I think after the first one, I was just kind of like, oh, I'm not in control (laughs) really at all. Um, You know, I'm in control of the way that I think and the way that I talk to myself and the things that I do. But in terms of like a physical injury, like your body's going to heal and you got to work with it and not think that you're going to like work over it. Yeah, there was it seemed like there was an echo in terms of you know it's become a cliche but in terms of controlling what you could control in you know the other great pinnacle of stress in your life in 2016 during the fallout after you know taking the knee you you were able to get yourself psychologically in a place where you could narrow your focus down to controlling what you could control which in that instance was just your own fitness basically Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 managed to survive a very turbulent period by you know narrowing your your gaze more or less yeah I had a lot of help narrowing it too (laughs) Sue would always be like narrow that down I'm like okay yeah I got a couple of those uh texts saved in a in a draft somewhere um but yeah I mean that that period is is you know a perfect example because I really like was not being treated fairly and Mm -hmm. not being treated fairly for a reason that's like really you're not going to treat me fairly because like I stood up for like racism in the country are you crazy like this is insane is anybody else seeing this but it was unfair and I and honestly I had seen her you know Jill uh, our coach at the time I had seen her treat other players fairly unfairly and I was just like this is like just this is just not fair this is just it's really a hard pill to swallow and it's like swallow it right like you don't have any other choice. The pill is in your mouth, like it's happening. So you either swallow it and get on with it and try to manage around it and just do whatever you can, or you drive yourself nuts, first of all, and, you know, potentially do things or say things that, you know, are, are against what I believe in and against my character and, you know, would put me in a worse 
position if I ever were to get back in. So some of it, it's like, you know, sometimes life's not fair, but I feel like things balance out in the end. And Sue always says to me and definitely said to me a lot in that, like you can control, you know, your reputation and how you handle yourself. Like that's all you have. And I think in sports, you know, when we have a lot of people coming through different coaches at different times, different players at different times, we play on different club teams, different managers, you know, sponsors, whatever. Like if you, if you put yourself in a position where like you've tarnished your reputation because you lashed out, then mm -hmm. like, that's kind of on you. Yeah. And you know, things are going to fall where they do. And eventually, you know, very thankfully I, I got back in the team, but I think that that really stuck with me. Like, you know, eventually this is going to be beyond soccer and you're not going to be playing anymore. And like, what kind of person do you want to be then? It's very interesting that, that she um, guided you towards the line between taking an admirable stand and self-indulgently having a meltdown when it didn't, <laughs> when it didn't deliver the results you, you know, you liked. It's, but it's tricky to find the line sometimes, right? It is. Yeah, it <laughs> is. And it was, those were not, um, you know, easy words to hear always it's like it's pretty much the opposite of what I, what I wanted to hear and the exact of what I needed to hear at that time and yeah it was because it was like I was doing you know I, I obviously knelt for a very good reason I would do it again a hundred times over um, but you know things things happen people react and you, you can't always control those things right well I think like you say that that you were armed by the fact that you never go into these um, demonstrations or fights um, underprepared. I mean, you're not just on a whim taking political positions. You make sure that you no. are completely rehearsed in terms of what it is that you're saying and doing. You know, you educated yourself over months and years. This this wasn't a flippant gesture. No, it wasn't. It, it, the The moment is always spontaneous because I never know when the moment's going to present itself. You know, I'd obviously been interested in reading all about Ferguson and the years after in the summer of 2016. I mean, it was everywhere. It was like you would, you know, you'd have to be sort of purposely avoiding it to not um, be in it at least a little bit. And then, yeah, the moment just came. And I, I feel like it took me a while to actually figure out that that's what I was doing. Cause people are always like, Oh my God, you just like say stuff. And then there's all this fallout and you didn't think about that after. I was like, well, I didn't really like not think about it, but I, I just, no, I don't weigh things like after. I mean, sometimes those things pop into my head and I hate that. It's just like, oh, should I do this or should I not? And it's like, that's not the question you need to be asking yourself. The question is on the other side. And then, you know, I just think if you do the right thing and, you know, you're prepared and you're humble and have that humility, then things will work out the way they should. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is a question that speaks to everybody at the moment in one way or another. Um, uh, from Kayla in Bellingham, Washington. How do you self-care and de-stress? Oh, um, I'm, I'm trying everything right now because it just seems like a very tumultuous time. Um, how do I self-care and de-stress? Um, I do like to be at home a lot. Um, obviously, normally I'm traveling a lot, so being at home um, is really relaxing. I definitely like need my people. I don't have a lot of friends, like a huge network of friends, um, but you know, my family and my close friends just are, you know, my, my absolute center. And so to be around, you know, people that just know me and like, you know, on a, on a humor level are, you know, where I'm at, um, and like the same humor, or just kind of like on an intellectual level to be able to talk about things. Like people always ask what my hobbies are. And I'm like, I don't know, like dinner. I love dinner. <laughs> like is, is going to dinner a hobby? I don't know. Um, you know, I like to, uh, drink a little wine that, that always helps. Um, but yeah, I do just like to just kind of be with people. I am a very social person. Um, so I, I, it's like, I like downtime with my people. I think mm -hmm. that's the best way to put it. You're a big music person, right? Which we never really talked about. And there's a, there's a good yeah. musician from Daniel in California, which artists or songs get you the most pumped up before a match? You do that? Do you like, do you, do you, do you have a like pre-match playlist that just makes you yell at yourself? Sometimes. I, yeah, sometimes. Um, I love Sia. 
a lot. She is so amazing. Um, in the World Cup, I was listening to a lot of Nipsey Hussle and a lot of Eminem. Those were like good ones for me. I don't have like a specific, I don't have to do like this song at this time, blah, blah, blah. And when I get in the locker room, I like to just kind of hear it all. I don't, I, I try not to be like too overly superstitious or try to do the exact same things. Cause honestly, I forget what they are. And then you're like having to, you know, have that feeling. So, and really I do the same exact thing every time I get into the locker room anyway. So it's like, there's just a series of things you have to do. Um, but there are like, yeah, like certain songs. I get obsessed with songs too, right. where it's like, I'll just only want to listen on this song on repeat for, you know, however long. So Sue's actually an amazing DJ and has this like an insane catalog of um, music in, in her head. So she's always on the DJ and I'm just like, you know, <laughs> bopping around, like getting what? taken on this wonderful ride. Yeah. Um, uh, hang on. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to summon an answer to this instantaneously, but it's interesting. This is from Jenna in Nashville in Tennessee. If you could spend an entire day with someone who is not alive, who would it be? I mean, I'm thinking someone famous from world history rather than, you know, yeah. grandmother or something, but I don't know. Yeah. You know what? It, it might be my mom's mom. Oh. Um, she's, yeah. She, or, or, or her grandmother or my mom's grandmother, who I met briefly when I was very young. Yeah. Um, but she was she was very old and I was very young and I, I don't remember much about it. Um, but I never was able to meet my mom's mother, who's you know spoken of in the highest regard by everybody, by all of my mom's siblings and everyone who knew her. And, um, you know, clearly my my mom came from her. And my mom speaks very highly of her. So I would have loved to meet her. I think she was a, a firecracker. I think it would have you know, I would have seen myself in her a lot, I think. Well, the matrilineal line of you, your mom, your mom's mom, and then great grandma Anna. Yeah, it's name. wild. Who, by the way, I feel like buy the book for, again just for Anna because I, she's just begging for the whole HBO treatment because she was like yeah. this, you know, she was a widow at a time. She ran this huge ranch after her husband died, and she knew how to like sell livestock at the market back when ladies and skirts didn't do that kind of thing. And you, you see the direct line. Good. Yeah, no, she was wild. She was like totally trailblazer. She like not only had tons of kids, but you know, lived in a time when a lot of them died. So dealt with so much, you know, grief and sadness. Mm -hmm. Um, her husband passed before her quite early and so had to run this entire ranch, which she was fully capable and seemed, you know, it seemed like the norm most normal thing for her to do that. And just was like full of life and you know, died very old, still living on her own. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a, a wildness trait that's yeah. running, running deep in, in the Kimball side of the family. Yeah. It's very, it's a very, uh, it feels to me as an outsider, like a quintessentially American story, just quite yeah. sort of rugged women. Um, yeah. Not for some of their men folks, uh, shortcomings <laughs> with firmness, but kindness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Wait, let's see. Um, Again, this is very broad, but it's interesting to me if you can isolate a single thing. This is from Michelle in California. What's the biggest factor that helped you to be a successful soccer player? Mm, I think that understanding that you can't compare yourself to anyone else. I think that's something that I learned very early playing on the national team in particular where everyone's amazing. Yeah. everyone's better than you at something or a lot of things. Like everyone on the team is, is they have these certain things that like, I just can't even get close to. But in turn, if you sort of flip that, it's like, no one can do what I can do and mm -hmm. all are equally as important. And so kind of going back to that, that sort of individuality and like my necessity to constantly get the most out of myself and, and be exactly what I want to be and who I am. I think that that sort of allowed me to like let go of whether it's insecurity or comparison mm -hmm. to other players. I mean, I'm, I've never been the biggest, strongest, fastest, like, you know, most talented in, in all of these ways. And so I think it just allowed me to like develop my game in the most, something that's different and something that's unique to me. And I think, you know, while that probably frustrated a lot of coaches and a lot of, a lot of teammates from time to time, 
I think it really cultivated who I was as a player who in the biggest moments was like, you know, um, a special player who was doing things that nobody else could do as were all my teammates. Well, that's brilliant. And that's why everybody should buy this book for their kids. Cause it's such, I can't wait till my children are old enough to, to be able to be delivered that message over and yeah. over again. Um, we have mm-hmm. I'd like to do one more question. I haven't asked the Sue question and honestly, I'm so over the engagement enough already. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, <Same. laughs> oh, um, but um, congratulations. Um, it looked very romantic. Um, yeah, there's very a cute. question that's coming, which I really like from Vanya in Seattle in Washington, which is you've, I, you've probably have been asked it before, but I am curious who would fare better you in the WNBA or Sue in the, you know, uh, women's soccer, national soccer team. It's, it's gotta be Sue in soccer. I, I just think that my sheer size is a problem. The basketball, I um, guess. Yeah. yeah, there's so much going on too. There's like all these plays you have to memorize, like specific plays. I think I would forget a lot of them. Um, I foul a lot. Um, I always say she would be really good in soccer. She's like obviously an amazing point guard and has really great vision and like, you know, gets the most out of herself and all of her teammates. So I think that she would be a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, all right. Well, we we're, I think we're just about out of time um uh i'm so uh i'm uh, to everybody who's watching there are i believe possibly still some signed copies available if you go to premiercollectibles.com premier has an e on the end you might be interested to learn <laughs> i was not aware of that premier.com slash one life um and uh and obviously the book is now uh for sale every, everywhere else and um we would urge you to buy it. It's amazing. It's funny. It's clever. <laughs> it's inspiring. Um, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you today. And um, uh, we're all very excited to see what you do next. There were a lot of questions about what you're going to do post retirement, but I felt that they were a little bit rude. <laughs> Is it? I know. About that? I feel. No, I know. it's it's not rude. I just don't really have a great answer. I was like, I, it really puts me on the spot of like I should have you know like a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> of like what's next. It, I think it it will look very similar to what I'm doing now, just without the soccer, which that that seemed that it obviously is a big part of it, but. I think I'll be able to do even more of, you know, the activism stuff and business building and, you know, just generally trying to change the world and make it more gay. So. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Bye. 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 Bye.